हेलो मेडिकोज एंड वेलकम बैक टू माय चैनल वंस अगेन इफ यू रियली लाइक द वीडियो प्लीज लाइक इट शेयर इट विद योर फ्रेंड्स एंड सब्सक्राइब टू माय चैनल हिट द बेल आइकन सो यू आर द फर्स्ट वन टू गेट नोटिफाइड एज सुन एज आई अपलोड द वीडियो सो लेट्स डिस्कस ट्रैकोमा टुडे ट्रैकोमा इज अ क्रॉनिक कैरेटो कंजंक्टिवाइटिस इट वाज अर्लियर कॉल्ड एज एन इजिप्शियन ऑपथैल्मिया Kerato conjunctivitis. So kerato means cornea and conjunctivitis is involving the conjunctiva. It involves cornea as well as the conjunctiva. What is it characterized by? It is characterized by a mixed follicular as well as a papillary response of the conjunctival tissue. You can say trachoma is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness in the world. Okay. If uh, if you see in Greek trachoma means rough. So this rough will represent, or you can say it describes the surface appearance of the conjunctiva in chronic trachoma. Okay, coming to the etiology now. The causative organism first, as you all know, the causative organism is your chlamydia trachomatis. From your second year, you know that it is a Bethsonian organism belonging to the PLT group. Now, what is this PLT group? PLT is cytokosis lymphogranuloma trachoma group. See the genus Chlamydia is divided into three species: the cytokosis, the lymphogranulomatous, and the trachomatous. Right. So cytokosis is in animals, lymphogranulomatous and trachomatous is in humans. In trachomatous, you have different serotypes. Basically, eleven serotypes: A, B, B, A, and C cause the hyperendemic trachoma, in which the transmission is from eye to eye. We'll be learning this now. Okay, where are serotypes D to K? They cause para trachoma, which includes your neonatal as well as the adult inclusion conjunctivitis. Here, the transmission is from genitals to the eye. Right. Coming to the second one, which is the lymphogranulomatous, it has three serotypes: L one, L two, L three. It causes lymphogranuloma venereum conjunctivitis, where the transmission is also from the genitals to your eye. This chlamydia trachomatis is an epithelium-loving organism. So you can say uh, chlamydia trachomatis is epitheliotropic. And what does it produce? It produces intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies, which are called your HP bodies, right? Coming to the predisposing factors now. The predisposing factors can be subdivided as the sex, and it is predominantly seen in the females, and no race is immune. As far as the age is concerned, there's no age bar, but this infection is usually contracted during infancy and early childhood. Okay, then. The socio-economic status. The disease is more common in poor classes. Why? Owing to the unhygienic living conditions they are in. Then you can say overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, abundant fly population, paucity of water, lack of materials like you know separate towels or handkerchiefs. Also, lack of education and understanding about the spread of contagious disease is the main factor. Then the climate. Trachoma is very common in areas with dry and dusty weather. Coming to the environmental factors, uh, like exposure to dust, smoke, irritants, sunlight, all these will increase the risk of contracting the disease. So what you can say is the outdoor workers are relatively at higher risk. That means they are more affected when compared to your office workers. Now, what is the source of infection? Source of infection is your conjunctival discharge of the affected person. Now, how can this conjunctival discharge be transmitted? So, the mode of infection can be a direct spread, a vector spread, or material transfer. Direct spread is from airborne or waterborne modes, whereas vector transmission is through your flies. Okay. Then the material transfer will play an important role in the spread of trachoma. How does this material transfer occur? It may occur through the contaminated fingers of doctors, nurses, and contaminated tonometers. Also, the source of material transfer can be through common towels, handkerchiefs, beddings, and often the surma rods. Okay. 
so now coming to the clinical picture if you see the incubation period the incubation period can vary from anywhere between 5 and 21 days the onset of trachoma is insidious or you can say subacute rarely it can also be an acute onset the symptoms of trachoma can be uh, studied in the presence of a secondary infection or in the absence of a secondary infection if there is no secondary infection in a trachoma then the symptoms will be very minimal like you know mild foreign body sensation occasional lacrimation slight stickiness of the lids scanty mucoid discharge but when there is secondary infection in a trachoma patient the symptoms will be very typical and what are those they are the typical symptoms of acute mucopurulent conjunctivitis like you know discomfort and foreign body sensation mild photophobia mucopurulent discharge sticking together of the lid margins slight blurring of vision and colored halos so all these were the typical symptoms of acute mucopurulent conjunctivitis which are seen in a patient of trachoma with superimposed bacterial infection what are the signs now? The signs of trachoma can be divided into conjunctival signs and the corneal signs, right? In conjunctival signs, you can see the congestion of upper tarsal and the fornicial conjunctiva. Then you can see conjunctival follicles. These are more commonly seen on your upper tarsal conjunctiva and the fornix. But they can also be present in the lower fornix, plica semilunaris and caruncle. Sometimes follicles may also be seen on bulbar conjunctiva. Then this is the pathognomic of trachoma. Okay. What are the follicles? I'll just explain you in a short time. Coming to the papillary hyperplasia. Papillary hyperplasia. That means the papillae are hyper, have undergone hyperplasia. First of all, what are papillae? Papillae are nothing but they are reddish flat top raised areas. So, because of papillary hyperplasia, this gives a red and velvety appearance to the tarsal conjunctiva. Okay. Now, what are these papillae? I told you they are reddish flat top raised areas, right? So, what do they consist of? The central core is of numerous dilated blood vessels. Whereas, peripherally, you have the surrounding lymphocytes. And this will be covered by hypertrophic epithelium. Okay. Coming to the conjunctival scarring. Now, conjunctival scarring can be either irregular, star-shaped or linear. If there is a linear scar, okay. In sulcus subtarsalis, you will call it as Alts line. What are concretions? Concretions are nothing but they are hard looking whitish deposits. Then can That can be either pinpoint to 2 millimeters in size. They are non-calcareous deposits. Okay. How are they formed then if they are non-calcareous? They are formed due to dead epithelial cells accumulating and the inspissated mucus in the depressions called glands of Henle. Okay. So, concretions are non-calcareous deposits formed due to accumulation of dead epithelial cells and inspissated mucus in the depressions called glands of Henle. Congestion of upper tarsal and furnitial conjunctiva, conjunctival follicles, papillary hyperplasia, conjunctival scarring that is Alts line and concretions are your conjunctival signs. Let's go to the corneal signs now. Corneal signs, the first is your superficial keratitis in the upper part of cornea. Then you can see Herbert follicles. This will also be uh, similar to your conjunctival follicles but will be seen in the area of limbus in the Herbert pits. I'll discuss in a short while. Then panis. Panis is nothing but it is the infiltration of cornea which is associated with vascularization in the upper part of cornea. Here the vessels will be superficial and they will lie between your epithelium and Bowman's membrane from the histology of your cornea. Right. Then coming to your corneal ulcer. Corneal ulcer will develop at the advancing edge of the spanus. This ulcer is usually shallow but it can become chronic and indolent. Now, Herbert pits. Herbert pits are nothing but they are oval or circular pitted scars which are left after healing of Herbert follicles in the limbal area. 
corneal opacity is present usually in the upper part of cornea but can extend down and it can involve the pupillary area as well. So you can say corneal opacity is the end result of trachomatous corneal lesion. Okay. So now coming to the structure of the conjunctival follicles. The structure of conjunctival follicles basically you can see that they look like boiled sago grains. Okay. So these are your boiled sago grains. When you turn your tarsal conjunctiva, you can see small whitish appearing follicles which give the appearance of your boiled sago grain, right? So you can say they appear like boiled, si boiled sago grains. What are the common sites? The common sites are your upper tarsal conjunctiva and the fornix but this can also be seen in the lower fornix, plica semilunaris and caruncle. Sometimes you can see this even on the bulbar conjunctiva. So this is the pathognomic of trachoma. Now how are they formed? This is very important. These follicles are formed because of the scattered aggregation of lymphocytes and other cells in the adenoid layer of the conjunctiva. So the central part of each follicle will be made up of mononuclear histocytes, few lymphocytes and large multinucleated cells. These are called as Leber cells. L-E-B-E-R. Okay. Leber cells. Whereas the cortical part will be made up of actively proliferating lymphocytes. The most peripheral part will have your blood vessels. In the later stages, the follicles, they can show necrosis as well. Now let's compare it with the papillae. I already told you, okay, papillae, it, the central core will consist of a dilated vessel and the peripheral part has lymphocytes. Whereas in a follicle, what was there in the peripheral part? There were blood vessels. Central part, you had histiocytes, lymphocytes and Leber cells. Cortical part, lymphocytes. Okay, so that is the difference between a follicle and a papillae. Now, let's see what is a panis. Panis is the infiltration of cornea which is associated with vascularization which is seen in the upper part of cornea. See the diagram over here. Right. So, you have two types of panis. One is progressive panis and the other one is the regressive panis. Now the blood vessels which are vascularizing here, they will be superficial. That is between your epithelium and the Bowman's membrane. Later stages, Bowman's membrane can also be destroyed. That is completely a different thing. Uh, now what is a progressive panis? In progressive panis, you can see that this infiltration of cornea is ahead of vascularization. If you observe here, the vessels stop after a short distance, whereas the infiltration is ahead of the vascularization, right? So, this is progressive type of panis. Now, what is regressive panis? In regressive panis, vessels will extend a short distance beyond infiltration, right? So, infiltration is only till here. But these vessels are extending for a short distance beyond this infiltration. So, this is called as regressive panis. Clinical picture, see here. This is the infiltration, whereas the blood vessels have stopped here. So, this is a progressive type, where infiltration is ahead of vascularization. Whereas, in this diagram, you can see the infiltration has stopped here, but the vessels are extending a short distance beyond infiltration. So, this is your regressive type of panis. Okay. Now, what shall we discuss here? Uh, let's see one more diagram on the vascularization of cornea, that is panis. This diagram is a bit more clear. See here the small vessels which you can see, right? So, this is your vascularization. Whereas, infiltration has gone till here. So, now you must say, what do you call this? Since the infiltration is beyond the vascularization, you will call it as a progressive panis. That is infiltration ahead of vascularization. In the science, I told you about the Herbert pits. If you observe here, you can see small oval or circular pitted scars, right? This one here, here, this is one more over here and here. So, these are your Herbert pits. They are nothing but they are the oval or circular pitted scars which are left after healing of Herbert follicles in the limbal area, right? So, this was about the signs and the symptoms of trachoma. So, coming to the sequelae of trachoma. The sequelae of trachoma can be 
classified as what happens in the lids in the conjunctiva in the cornea and others in the lids either it can be the thickening of the eyelids the inward drawing of the eyelashes or some other uh, sequelae all these are a separate short essay and will be discussed in detail in the chapter of the lids okay so what are those they are the trichiasis the entropion the ptosis the medorosis and chyloblepharon whereas the conjunctival sequelae are the concretions the pseudocyst the xerocyst the symblepharon this is the symblepharon see here then the corneal sequelae are corneal opacity ectasia corneal xerosis total corneal panis what are the other sequelae chronic dacrocystitis and chronic dacroedenitis right what is the complication of trachoma the only complication of trachoma is corneal ulcer it can occur due to rubbing by concretions or trichiasis with superimposed bacterial infection now we have to see the grading of trachoma grading of trachoma you have two classifications one is mckellan's classification and the other one is who classification so let's go with the mckellan's classification first in this you have four important stages stage 1 2 3 and 4 stage 1 is otherwise called as your incipient trachoma or stage of infiltration now what is incipient trachoma or stage of infiltration here it is characterized by hyperemia of palpebral conjunctiva and immature follicles okay whereas stage 2 is an established stage or florid infiltration here you can see follicles papillae and progressive corneal panis as well stage 3 is your cicatrizing trachoma or stage of scarring so you can see the obvious scarring of palpebral conjunctiva which can be linear or uh, irregular or star shaped then stage 4 is your healed trachoma or stage of sequelae here what happens is the sequelae will occur due to the cicatrization now this gives rise to the symptoms okay the disease is quite and cured in stage 4 but sequelae will occur due to cicatrization okay coming to the second classification now which is your who classification this is the latest classification that is uh, being followed now which is otherwise called as fisto classification f i s t o so before going into the classification let's know what is a normal tarsal conjunctiva so in this diagram over here you can see the dotted line will show the area which you have to examine in the tarsus that is after folding your upper eyelid that is your tarsal conjunctiva so in a normal eyelid the eyelids and cornea are observed first for any internal eyelashes or any corneal opacity now the upper eyelid will be turned over that is everted and you will examine the conjunctiva over the stiffer part of the upper lid that is your tarsal conjunctiva normally the conjunctiva is pink smooth thin and transparent over the whole area of tarsal conjunctiva you can see normally large deep lying blood vessels that will run vertically okay this is the picture of a normal eyelid so coming to your who classification now the first stage is your trachomatous inflammation follicular f for follicular so fisto f is stage of trachomatous inflammation follicular now tf in this what happens is it is the stage of active trachoma with predominantly follicular inflammation how do you diagnose this stage for diagnosing for diagnosis of uh, follicular stage there should be presence of five or more follicles in the upper tarsal conjunctiva and the deep tarsal vessels should be visible through the follicles and the papillae and the follicle should be at least 0.5 mm or more in diameter so this is the diagnostic criteria follicles you already know they are round swellings right they are paler than the surrounding conjunctiva which can appear white gray or yellow the second is your trachomatous inflammation intense i okay t i trachomatous inflammation intense what happens in this stage is 
It is diagnosed when pronounced inflammatory thickening of upper tarsal conjunctiva obscures more than half of the normal deep tarsal vessels. The tarsal conjunctiva will appear red, rough and thickened. They are usually numerous follicles that can be partially or totally covered by the thickened conjunctiva. Okay. So, first stage, then the second stage is it has become intense now. Now, coming to the third one, which is your trachomatous scarring. Okay. Now, trachomatous scarring is nothing but it is the presence of scarring in the tarsal conjunctiva. Scars are very easily visible as white lines, bands or sheets in tarsal conjunctiva. You can observe here, you can observe the white glistening tarsal conjunctiva. So, they are glistening and fibrous in appearance. Scarring can be due to diffuse fibrosis and because of scarring, there will be the tarsal blood vessels are obscured. Okay. So, this was your third. First was your follicular, then intense, then scarring. FIS. Now, coming to T. That is trachomatous trichiasis. Trichomatous trichiasis is labeled when at least one eyelash will rub the eyeball. Okay. Evidence of recent removal of interned eyelashes should also be graded as trichomatous trichiasis. Okay. F-I-S-T. Then the last one. O. Oh, corneal opacity. Corneal opacity stage is labeled when easily visible corneal opacity is present over the pupil. This science refers to corneal scarring that is so dense that at least part of pupil margin is blurred when seen through the opacity. Right. Now, such corneal opacities will cause significant visual impairment because it is in the region of pupil. So, the vision will be less than 6 by 18 or 0.3 vision. Therefore, visual acuity should be measured whenever possible, right? So, F-I-S-T-O, follicular, intense, scarring, trichiasis, opacity. This was the WHO classification of trachoma. Coming to the diagnosis. The diagnosis can be your clinical diagnosis and the lab diagnosis. Clinical diagnosis of trachoma is from the typical signs and symptoms. After you look for the signs and symptoms, you will grade them according to your FISTO classification. Then lab diagnosis is possible only when there are advanced labs in the areas, right? Advanced laboratory tests are employed uh, for research purposes only. Now, how do you lab diagnose it? The first thing is your conjunctival cytology. What do you do? You take a conjunctival discharge and Jamesa stain smear is done. When you Jimsa stain it, you will see that it shows predominantly polymorphonuclear reaction with presence of plasma cells and Leber cells. So, when plasma cells and Leber cells are present, it is the, it is suggestive of trachoma, right? Coming to detection of inclusion bodies. So, for this also, you will take a conjunctival smear and stain it with Jimsa iodine stain or immunofluorescent staining. This is more uh, commonly done in stages of active trachoma rather than chronic ones. Coming to the ELISA enzyme linked immunosorbent assay is done for chlamydial agents. Polymerized chain reaction can also be done. It is also useful. Then how do you isolate chlamydia? Isolation of chlamydia will be possible by yolk sac inoculation method. Okay. And tissue culture technique. What is the standard single passage? McCoy cell culture. It requires how many days? Three days. Right. Then the serotyping of TRIC agents is done by detecting specific antibodies using microimmunofluorescence method. Direct, nono, uh, direct monoclonal fluorescent antibody microscopy of conjunctival smear is uh, very rapid and in, uh, inexpensive. So you can do that as well. What are the differential diagnoses now? Differential diagnosis is trachoma with follicular hypertrophy. Since you already know that trachoma is a mixed reaction, right? Follicular type as well as papillary. So, supposingly it is predominantly follicular, 
then you have to differentiate it from acute adenoviral follicular conjunctivitis which is otherwise called as epidemic keratoconjunctivitis how do you differentiate it now so if you look for the distribution of follicles in trachoma it is mainly seen on upper palpebral conjunctiva and upper fornix right while in epidemic keratoconjunctivitis or your adenoviral follicular conjunctivitis it is seen in the lower palpebral conjunctiva and the lower fornix is predominantly involved if you look for the associated signs like papillae and pannus they are characteristics of trachoma and the pannus is not seen in your epidemic keratoconjunctivitis for the lab diagnosis of trachoma uh, will obviously help you differentiate between trachoma and the other things then if the trachoma is predominantly papillary type that is trachoma with predominant papillary hypertrophy it is important for you to differentiate it from vkc vkc is your spring catar now how do you differentiate it papillae will be large in size and like cobblestone appearance or cobblestone arrangement in your spring catar comparatively smaller in your trachoma then the ph of tears will be alkaline in spring catar and acidic in trachoma if you look for the discharge spring catar it is ropy discharge the follicles and pannus will be present in trachoma and not in vkc conjunctival cytology and other lab diagnosis for trachoma usually help in diagnosing it clean um, in cases where you can clinically uh, where the clinical picture is not very clear so clinically indistinguishable cases you can go for lab tests okay so what is the management now the management will involve curative management as well as the control measures now the first thing is treatment of active trachoma suppose there is an active case of trachoma how do you treat it you go for a topical therapy okay antibiotics for the treatment of active trachoma uh, can be given either topically or systemically but you prefer to give a topical therapy why because comparatively it is cheaper and there is no risk of systemic side effect also the local antibiotics will be effective against bacterial conjunctivitis which may be associated with trachoma so for all these reasons you first prefer for a topical therapy what is given in it any of the following regimen can be followed first regimen is your tetracycline 1% or erythromycin 1% four times a day for six weeks or you can go for self acetamide eye drops three times a day along with tetracycline 1% ointment at bedtime for 6 weeks coming to the systemic therapy systemic therapy regimens will include either tetracycline or erythromycin 250 mg orally four times a day for four weeks or doxycycline 100 mg orally twice daily for three to four weeks or azithromycin 1 gram start followed by 250 mg once daily for 4 days okay now you can also give a combined topical and systemic therapy where in severe cases or in associated genital infections because when there is associated genital infections obviously the topical therapy will not cure the genital infection so you have to give a combined topical and systemic therapy what is it any of this the first thing is tetracycline or erythromycin i ointment four times daily for six weeks that is your topical therapy you have to combine it with your systemic therapy which is tetracycline or erythromycin 250 mg orally four times daily for two weeks this is your combined therapy now always the continuous treatment should be followed by an intermittent treatment what is intermittent treatment i'll tell you coming to the treatment of trachoma sequelae if the concretions are the sequelae then go for hypodermic needle if trichiasis has occurred then you can either uh, remove it by epilation electrolysis or cryolysis if the sequelae is entropion then you will surgically correct it if it is xerosis artificial tears and similarly for other sequelae you will have treatments respective to that sequelae okay coming to the prophylaxis for trachoma infection now how do you 
prevent it. What is the prophylaxis? Since immunity is very poor and short-lived, reinfections and recurrences are likely to occur. So you should follow all this against the infection of trachoma. First thing is your hygienic measures. Hygienic measures will help a great deal in decreasing the transmission of disease. Because trachoma is closely associated with personal hygiene and environmental sanitation. So health education on trachoma should be given to public. Uh, you should also while educating them, let them know that use of common towels, handkerchiefs, surma rods should always be discouraged. A good environmental sanitation will reduce the flies and a good water supply would improve the washing habits. So all these are your hygienic measures. Then any case of conjunctivitis, please treat them as early as possible. So early treatment of conjunctivitis will help to possibly reduce the transmission of disease. The third one is your blanket antibiotic therapy. This is your intermittent treatment which I just told you. So, intermittent treatment is, uh, according to WHO, the WHO has recommended this. What is it? It has recommended this regimen to be carried out in endemic areas. Endemic areas for trachoma to minimize the intensity and severity of disease. This regimen is to apply 1% tetracycline eye ointment twice daily for 5 days in a month. For 6 months. Okay. Now prevention of trachoma blindness is by your safe strategy. What is this safe, st safe strategy? Safe strategy is WHO recommended. It is for the elimination of trachoma as public health problem. S stands for your surgery. So you have to always do a surgery for the advanced disease. A is antibiotics. Antibiotics to clear the infection. F is facial cleanliness. That is importance of hygiene. Then E is environmental improvement to reduce the transmission. This is all the safe strategy. So with this, the topic of trachoma comes to an end. Thank you for being with me.